Okay, so today I'm asking a very simple question. How many? It should be really simple. All we need to do is be able to count. How many seats are there in this auditorium? Just go around and count them. But if that was the end of the story, it would be a very short and boring talk. So we're going to see the question how many is not as easy in some cases as you would perhaps think. So let's think of some simple questions. We've already had one. How many people attended this talk? Many times you've been to um, some form of school fete or whatever, you often have to win a prize by guessing how many sweets are in a jar. But how to do that accurately, we just take them out and count them. It's really easy, it's a counting exercise. We even teach our children basic arithmetic by counting, asking the question, how many? Sally puts four pencils on a table. Henry adds two more. How many pencils are now on the table? Really simple. But as we get older, or as our children get older and start asking us more difficult questions, we start to answer a question, how many, with the answer, I don't know. For example, how many blue whales are there in the world? Now, if we could find all the blue whales in the world, it's a really simple counting exercise. But that's a big if. We cannot easily see the blue whales. We may see some of them, but typically we wouldn't be able to go and count all of them. So all these populations I've listed here, you can be regarded as hidden populations. And that's what we're really interested in. How many illegal immigrants are there in the UK? We don't actually know. It's a hidden population. We don't ask on the census that comes round every 10 years in the UK, are you an illegal immigrant? Well, we could ask, ask it, but we wouldn't get very good responses. So we cannot easily see some populations. So then when we have these populations and we ask the question, how many, it's not a simple counting exercise. So we are going to look at four such questions in this talk. Um, dating back the first one to 1802, which now is quite a much simpler question of how many people live in a country or what is the population of France. Now we have a census. Back in 1802, there was no census for the whole country. And Laplace, a very famous um, scholar, particularly in mathematics, actually answered this question in 1802. So we're going to go back quite over 200 years to see how we could have answered that then. And then we're going to look at three modern-day questions. How many people are living as modern-day slaves in the UK? Some of you may have seen some newspaper articles on this uh, last November, December time. <coughs> how many injecting drug users are there in different parts of the UK? And particularly, I'm going to look at England and Scotland. Obviously, these are all difficult questions we cannot simply count. Again, we can't send a survey around uh, a given area and say, are you an injecting drug user? People are not typically going to answer that honestly. So what do we do? We've got these hidden populations that are difficult to observe. We could simply guess. But that's not very scientific. And it's unlikely to be very accurate. However, this might sound a stupid idea we could just guess. I am going to come back to this idea later at the end of the talk when I'm asking question four, what is the injecting drug user population of England? So we don't want to just guess. We want to be scientific. So in order to be able to answer these questions, we're going to have to collect some data. So how are we going to collect data? Well, we're going to try and observe the population as best we can. So I've taken the example of the homeless population in some area. And we're going to go and try and observe that population. So we might send a particular person out and say, go around this area and see how many individuals from the homeless population you can find. And they do this. They go out in this area and they say, well, I came back and I listed X individuals. What does that tell us? Well, it, it gives us some information, not a great amount, but we know, assuming all these individuals that they observe are members of the homeless population, we know there must be at least X homeless individuals in the population. The problem is, we've probably missed someone. 
So this is what we have here. This is our homeless population. There's 30 crosses. These are 30 individuals. And this individual went out. We're going to call them list A. And they observed the red individuals. So there's 12. So they missed, do my calculations, correct? 18. So we know, well, we don't know how many they missed. We only know that they saw 12. So all we have is a lower bound. We only know there must be at least 12. It gives us some information, but that information so far is very weak. So what can we do? We need to collect more data. So we repeat the exercise. We ask someone else, list B, to go out, and again, count all the homeless individuals that they see in the given area. And that's what they do. They go out and count everyone that they see. So they record Y individuals. In this case, they recorded 20. So they recorded more individuals than list A, and they recorded the black ones, uh, sorry, the blue ones. But again, they've missed 10 black ones, but we don't know that they've missed the 10 black crosses. All we know is they've seen 20. So does that improve our information? Well, it does. It tells us now we, they're not only a minimum of 12, they must be a minimum of 20. So it helps us in some sense, but we still basically, if we say, well, we know there must be a minimum of 20, we're still basically throwing away list A, because we said there was only 12 there, we've now seen 20, so we know 20 is the minimum number. That's still not great, because really we've still got this one data list, because we've effectively thrown away list A. Can we do better? Much better is going to be the answer. How are we going to do better? We're going to be a bit cleverer about our data. When we go out and try and observe members of the homeless population, when we see an individual, rather than just going one on our little um, list and then two, three and so on, we're going to stop, ask the individual some identifying questions so that we can uniquely ID them. So, for example, their name, date of birth, where they were born, and so on. So, there, and so we do this for every single individual. So now, our list A is not just the number 12, but it's 12 individuals. They have a row each. We have an, their initials, their date of birth, and their place of birth. And list B does exactly the same. Now they've got 20, and they've got the same information. So now we can marry up individuals that list A and B have both seen. So we know A3 and B1 is actually the same individual. Similarly, A12 and B20 is the same individual. And this extra piece of information is vital. This is the important bit that we need to do, is matching up so we know if an individual was seen by list A, whether or not they were seen by list B. So now, what does our data look like? So this should say list A and B. Uh, white didn't come out quite so clearly up on this board. It's clear on my computer. So now we've got black crosses are the ones we haven't seen. We still haven't seen everyone. Blue was seen by list B only. A red was seen by list A only. And the white crosses were seen by both list A and B. So we have four were only seen by list A. 12 were seen only by list B but eight individuals were seen by both A and B. So now we know the number of total individuals we saw, unique individuals, was 24. So the first thing we've done is increase our lower bound, but this is going to allow us to do more things. So let's put that into a bit more math speak, as I call it. So if each person that we observe within the study falls into one of three categories, one and only one category, Either they, both, they are seen on both lists, either that was the white ones, either they're only recorded on list A and not list B, they were the red individuals, they were recorded on list B but not A, were the blue individuals. And notation, we're going to introduce a small bit of notation. We're going to have this notation of two numbers in brackets, it's called a capture history typically in the community. The first number corresponds to whether or not they're observed by list A, and the second number corresponds to list B. A zero means they were not observed by that list, a one means they were observed. So one one for being observed on A and B, one zero observed on A, not B, and not one is not A, but observed on B. And in general, 
and we'll use this notation soon, we're going to use an nij, is the number of individuals with capture history ij, where ij is 1, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 1. So we already know the number of unique individuals is 24 by adding up these three numbers, the number observed by each of those histories. So we've got a better lower bound now, but we can do better. So this is how we typically display the data. It's exactly the same as we had on the previous slide, but just put into a table. So you've got list A, B. This means not observed by list A, observed by list A, not B, observed by B. And we've got, for example, the number observed by A, but not B. What we want to do is to estimate the missing number, the number that belonged to the population, but were not observed by A or B. And we denote that typically by N naught naught, given here. And this number is called the dark figure, or sometimes the hidden figure. I prefer dark figure. Sounds like as if it's something out of Star Wars. And then if we can estimate this dark figure, we can add it to the individuals we've seen and estimate our total population. That's what we want. So this is what the capital N denotes as the total population. Estimate the number not seen by either of the sources and add it to the ones that you have seen. So let's look at two examples before we explain how we can do that. So we've got two tables here. I'm going to concentrate on this one here after. In both of these examples, 24 individuals are observed. So here we've got first table, eight individuals are observed by both A and B, 12 by B but not A, four by A and not B. And I've got a slightly different configuration for this second example. It's the pattern of these numbers in the table that leads to how we estimate, or what the estimate of the total population is. So I'm going to give you the answers and then explain in two different ways how we come up with the numbers. So for the first table, our estimate of n is 30, which coincidentally was the true number of individuals in the previous example. I, I made it so that this was actually correct. In the second table, which doesn't look perhaps too different from the first table, the estimate is significantly larger. It's 80. So what's appeared to be quite similar tables actually comes up with very different estimates. If we think 24 are observed in total, we've only missed six, but here we've missed 56. And why is that? The sort of answer I'm going to give and not explain why until for another couple of slides is it's all to do with this number, really. The number of individuals observed by both sources. If it's relatively large, then the number of individuals you've missed is fairly small. If it's small, the number of individuals you've missed is fairly large. And hopefully you'll see why that is the case in a minute. So now I'm going to take Two, I'm going to show you two different ways of coming up with how we estimate these answers. It's the same result, but you can explain it in different ways. So let's go back to that first example. I'm going to concentrate on that one now and explain where that number comes from, how we estimated the population. So let's look at just the individuals that were observed by A. So that's this row of the table. Four individuals were only observed by A, Eight individuals were observed by both A and B. So let's just look at those two, not these two here. And what we're going to do is take the ratio of the number of individuals not observed to observed. Oh, I prefer to think of it typically the other way around. If we note, twice the number of individuals are observed by B as not observed by B, given that they were observed by A. So this number is twice as large as this number. So what we're going to do now is basically apply that ratio to those individuals that were not observed by A. In that case, we had twice the number of individuals were observed as not. Apply that here, twice the number not. That should be a six. So what we're doing is assuming the ratio of individuals not observed to observed is the same whether you're observed by A or not. Really simple, comparing ratios. And this, is, and this is where we get number 30 from. We, we get six here, and then we add it to the number that we see to get 30. 
we could have done it the other way around and looked at, say, let's look at the ratio for those individuals that are observed by B. Well, one and a half times more are not observed by A than observed by A, assuming they were observed by B, and apply exactly the same proportion to those not observed by B, and then so we'll have the question mark is one and a half times the size of four, which gives you again the value six. So it's assuming, when we come back to assumptions in a minute, that these ratios are the same. So that's ex explanation one. This is the more standard explanation if you look at Wikipedia. So, what we're going to do is another type idea, but rather than looking at ratios, we're going to look at proportions and equate proportions. So let's look at the proportion of individuals that are on list A for two different populations. One of them is the total population. So we want the proportion of the total population that are observed on list A. And then we say, OK, right, we can do that. Well, we could if we knew the total population. That's just add up the number you see on list A, divide by the total population. Remember, we don't know that. That's what we want to estimate. Then we look at the individuals on list B and look at the proportion of the individuals, all the individuals on list B, that are also on list A. So again, we just take the proportion. So it's the number on list A and B divided by the number on list B is the proportion. And we can argue that these proportions should be about the same if the probability that we're observed on list A is the same for the total population as for list B, which means if we're seen on list B, it doesn't affect the probability that we're seen on list A. So let's do that for our example. Well, 12 individuals in total were observed on list A. So the proportion is 12 over what we don't know, which is N, which we want to estimate. But now, the other proportion we do know, 20 individuals were observed on list B, and of those, 8 were also observed on list A, so the proportion is 8 over 20. We equate those proportions, and we get this equation. This will be the number of individuals on list A times the number of individuals on list B divided by the number of individuals on both A and B, and this number is again 30. So fairly simple. We're just equating proportions or ratios. So that's it as an example. Let's put it in, in math speak. And then we can see why the N11, the number of individuals observed by both lists, is important. So remember, we have, let's go back here to remind you, we equate the proportion seen on list A, so the number on list A divided by total, number on list A and B divided by the number on list B. So this is what we have, the number of total number observed by list A, what's well, the number observed only on list A, not B, plus the number observed on both, approximately equal to the number of individuals on both divided by the number of individuals on, listed on B. Rearrange the formula and we get the estimate given by that here. Number on A times by the number on B divided by the number on A and B. And this is why that cell, the number of individuals observed on list A and B is so important. The larger N11 is, because it's on the denominator, that makes N hat smaller. That makes our estimate of the total population smaller. The smaller the overlap, so the smaller the number of individuals observed by both A and B, this puts on the denominator, the larger this comes for our estimate of the total population. So that's why this overlap is so important. And that was called the Lincoln-Peterson estimator, um, and it's explained in a similar way on, on Wikipedia. So, that, let's see how Laplace ended up estimating what he, how he solved the problem of what is the population of France before there was a regular census. So Laplace was a renowned French scholar um, in the 18th and into the early 19th century, and he was called the French Newton, um, particularly in mathematics and physics. There was no whole census for France, but there was some census in some of the regions of France, and this is what um, Laplace is going to utilise. And it's, he didn't invent the idea, 
but he's the first famous application of this approach. So we had two, he had two lists. One was the birth certificates for all of France, which I'm calling list A, and that was about one million. And the second one was these regional census counts, these regional um, census counts that he had for part of France. And there was just over two million on there, and that's what I'm calling list B. Then we need to know the number of individuals that were recorded on both lists. And that was just shy of 72,000. So we can now substitute numbers straight into the formula for the Lincoln-Peterson estimator. It's the number observed on list A times the number on list B divided by the number on both A and B. And he came up with a number just over 28 million, which seems to be fairly similar to other estimates around about the time. So he seems to have done a fairly good job for what is a very simple approach. So it's very simple, which is good because it's easy to implement. Normally, when something is easy to implement and simple, the downside is it's also perhaps not very good. And that's normally the case here as well. There are limitations, and you have to be very careful that you look at the assumptions that you are making and check whether these are valid or not to the best of your ability. If your assumptions are not valid, things go very wrong very quickly. On our next slide, I'll show you an example of that. So what do we assume in this, in this um, Lincoln-Peterson estimator? We assume several things, but the notable one that we are going to be focusing on and is really the most important one is that we assume that if you are observed on list A, it does not affect the probability that you're observed on list B. Similarly, if you're observed by list B, it doesn't affect whether or not you're observed by list A. And this is called something called independence. So it means A and B are independent. They don't affect each other. I always like um, statistics a lot of the time because they use common sense English words and what they mean in English is actually what they mean in statistics. Things that are independent in English means they don't affect each other. And that's what we mean by here. Well, it's a more technical definition, but that's the basic essence of it. And so you should always go back. If you want to use this method, you should check that your lists are, to your best of your ability, independent of each other. It's not easy to do. But we'll see a way around that shortly. So what happens if your assumptions are not valid? We've assumed in the Lincoln Peterson we've got this independence between lists A and B. So to give you an idea of when things can go wrong, I picked this out of the uh, newspapers a few years ago. You may, this was quite prominent in Scotland. Um, only 100 adult cod let in the North Sea. That was barred enough, by the way. And we'll see why that was barred enough now. The telegraph was even worse. 100 cod left in the North Sea. What has gone wrong? There was a scientific report, and that was absolutely fine. It was an assumption that was made that led to this erroneous headlines. And there, there, were, there, there were some clarifications made. So what that happened, if you think about the adult cod phrase, only 100 adult cod left in the North Sea. What assumptions were being made? Well, the assumption that was being made was the definition of the word adult. The assumption was made that a cod reached adulthood, which basically means when they started breeding, at the age of 13. This number came up because they, they thought the North Sea was very, very much like the Mediterranean. And I live on the North Sea, and I can categorically state that is not true. <laughs> And they assumed that the fish in the Mediterranean were the same as the fish in the North Sea. And Mediterranean cod reach adulthood about 13. In the North Sea, it's about four to six. So uh, my favorite quote, uh, I don't think it is up here, is that um, someone also said that a cod age 13 in the North Sea is not an old, an adult cod, it's an ancient cod. Only six cod from the North Sea have ever been found in the last 30 years at the age of 13. So when you remove this assumption that they made the adult melt 13 and put the right definition in, you actually get 21 million. 
slight difference. If you go to the other headline, remember the other one was worth just 100 cod left in the North Sea. If you actually go to the number of cod in the North Sea, it's 437 million. So I think this is probably one of the, my favorite for the most wrong answers. So just, this is just to highlight the importance of assumptions. If you get your assumptions wrong, your interpretation is just nonsense. So what happens in our case, if we have this assumption, I said that we have sources and they have to, or lists which have to be independent? Well, we can't do anything basically with two sources. That is the best we can do. The trick is to say, okay, we can't do anything with two sources. Let's go and collect some more data as we did before. So we go out and collect more data. We send a third person out to count the homeless population, to count individuals in the homeless population. We uniquely ID them. So now we have three lists, A, B, and C. And we do a similar thing before to collect the data. And then we can put them in a table. Now we have seven possible categories that individuals can fall into, corresponding to the combinations of sources that they are observed by. For example, N011 is the number of individuals not as seen by A, but seen by B and seen by C. And in general, if you've got K sources, you have two to the K minus one observed data points because you can never observe this missing value, the number of individuals that you are in the population that you didn't see. So if we have this, more data, we can then allow for dependencies between lists. So, now we're going to go on to question two. How many individuals in the UK are living in modern day slavery? And this hit the headlines November, December last year. And there was a big um, media publicity about it. Slavery levels in the UK higher than thought. Um, and up to 13,000 working as slaves in the UK. How did they do this? this? So this was a report that was published by the Home Office. Uh, the chief scientific advisor to the Home Office is um, a statistician, and they were involved in doing this. And what did they have? Well, they had now five data sources, which leads to 31 uh, different categories that individuals can fall in, corresponding to what sources they are observed by. So these are the lists that were used. Uh, the numbers in brackets are the numbers observed by that list. In total, we just have 2,744 individuals are observed. Remember, the important thing is the pattern that they make in the table. And in particular, a lot of it relates to the overlap, how many individuals are seen by combinations of sources. It's not quite as clear as for the two source that we could show with a Lincoln-Peterson estimator, but still, it's still important. So we have 221 individuals observed on at least two lists, which is less than 10% of those that are seen. So we know how many are seen by these, but we want the dark figure. How many are there in total? If anyone's interested, although there's, it's easy to find the actual publication um, and actually the statistical analysis uh, online. So if we said, okay, we assume these lists are independent, we can do a similar thing to we did before, slightly more complicated formally, but we can still uh, calculate an estimate, and it would be about 13,500. But because we're only, remember, we're only estimating the total population, we can't go and count everyone, there's uncertainty, we also have an associated uncertainty interval. Technically, it's called a confidence interval. Um, but you don't need to know that. Just think about it. Well, it's likely to lie. Well, this interval is likely to contain the, the actual real, real number. But this is our best guess. So that's if you've got the independent model. However, if you look at the data or do a statistical analysis, it's fairly easy and very quick to show that the ind assuming independence between lists isn't very good. You can actually assess this, and it's, there are dependencies between the lists. And there are two types of dependencies you can have. A positive dependence between lists A and B means if you're seen on list A, you're more likely to be seen on list B and vice versa. A negative dependence is if you're seen on list A, 
you're less likely to be seen by source B. And there can be many reasons why this happens. So now we have two steps to do. Previously, if we had a, we know what we're doing, we're just estimating the total population if we assume independence. Now we say, well, we could have dependence between the lists. First question is, well, what, what dependencies exist? So we have to do a two-step process. The first one is to actually identify which dependencies exist between which lists. And then given the dependencies that exist, what is the estimate of the total population size? So we do it in two steps. So in step one, we get six dependencies. Um, and I've just listed one here. We get a positive, which is interaction or dependence between police force and local authority lists. Which might be, a, you might think that's actually probably explainable quite easily, that police may be, you might be more likely to fall in some local authority list and vice versa. You've got bodies that are possibly doing the same thing and sharing information. So if you're seen on one list, you're more likely to also be seen on the other list. So that might be a good thing. And itself, these dependencies are also actually quite interesting in themselves to work out what's going on and for actually implementing policies and so on. We're not interested in that for this talk, but in general they are. If we then do this, so we've got our six dependencies, we refit that model, we get an estimate of just over 11,000 with the given uncertainty interval. And this is the um, number that one of the I can't remember which uh, media it was, said up to 13,000 slaves living in the UK. It was just taking this upper bound. However, had we ignored this dependence, we would have actually come up with an even higher estimate of the total population size, 13,000, over 13,500, and we would have had an upper bound of 15,000. So we need to take these into account, these dependencies. We need to identify them, which in itself might be of interest what dependencies exist, and then once we've identified them, estimate the total population. If we fail to do this and make assumptions like the sources are in, lists are independent, we're going to get wrong answers or poor answers, poor estimates. So that was question two. Let's look at question three. And three and four are similar. They're looking at injecting drug users. Again, this is a very difficult hidden population to see. It's very hard to identify injecting drug users. And we'll see that in particular when we get to, there's a star here for a reason. We use four sources. So now there are 15 possible categories an individual can be observed in, corresponding to observed or not observed by each of these, as long as they're observed by one. And we'll come back to this in a minute. So we've got these four sources, and we can just continue as normal. We go, right, turn the handle. We want to um, estimate the total population size. We do the same as we did last time. We'll work out which dependencies exist. Given that, we will estimate the total population size. Right, that's what we do on this slide. Then we'll show it's wrong. So we've got nearly 5,000 individuals. About 10% are seen on more than one list. So, we now do exactly what we did before. We account for the dependencies, we work out what ones exist, and they are quite a lot, I can't remember what they are now, but they are quite a lot of dependencies between these lists. And we get an estimate of the, of the 5,000, 31,000. So really, this is the tip of the iceberg. We've got six times as many, in total, so we're missing uh, four fifths. Is that right? Five six. Five six. And we've got a reasonably large uncertainty interval, which isn't surprising. Right, was that the end of the story? No. So we were chatting to um, people in Health Protection Scotland about this, and they went, hmm. Yeah, we need to think about these lists a bit more. This is what we've always used. But something's not quite right. And it's not right because of this hepatitis C virus database. It's, as I said, it's very difficult to observe injecting drug users. How do you do it? Well, what they do on the hepatitis C virus database, if someone goes to be tested for hepatitis C, they ask the individual 
What is your risk factor? And hepatitis C is something that can, you can um, be infected with and symptoms not appear for many years. It's going to lie sort of dormant. So they, you go to get tested for hepatitis C, and they say, what's your risk factor? And they were put injecting. Fine. But the risk factor could have been from 10 years ago. You may have stopped injecting, but you, that was your risk factor. You may have been an injector 10 years ago. You've stopped, so you're not actually a current injector. So that means we've got a bit of a problem with that data set. All the others we think are fine. They, they observe current injecting drug users. But for the hep if you're only observed by the hepatitis C virus, so if you're observed by any of the other sources, you, you're a current in injecting drug user. But if you're only observed by the hepatitis C virus database, you could be a current injector, or you could be a historical injector. And actually, you've stopped injecting, but it was still your risk factor. So what does that mean? Well, that means we need to think a bit more carefully what we're doing. So we had 776 individuals only recorded by the HCV database. But we don't know if all those are current injectors or past injectors. Well, they're going to be a combination of the both. So now, our number of individuals only observed by HCV database, denoted N0001, because they're not seen by any of the other sources, is actually not what we observe as 776. We know it's bounded by 776. We know the true number must be between 0 and 776. But we don't know what that number is. We can estimate it, though. We can incorporate this into our analysis. I'm not telling you how you do it, by the way. I'm saying we can do it. And then we get another. So if you do that correctly now, we get a slightly different estimate. We come up with an estimate of 15,200, which is slightly different to 31,000. We've halved our actual estimate of the total population. And again, it all goes back to, are our assumptions valid? And saying that all individuals observed by the HCV database are current injectors was not a valid assumption. And if you fail to take that into account, which we did in the first analysis, we get something that is very unreliable. And clearly, if you were um, someone involved in social or economic policy in Scotland, this is a much more worrying figure than that. So it's quite important to get these numbers right. They do have implications. They have implications on how uh, NHS is funded, how much funding they get, and so on, what policy is doing, and so on. So we need to be careful what we're doing. We need to look, think. We can't just run headlong into doing stuff, just turning a handle without thinking. We always need to think about what we're doing. It's dangerous not to think. So let's go to our last example. We've got England injecting drug users. Now, for England, they use different sources in Scotland, and I'm glad to say there's no HCV database, because that makes my life a lot easier. They use four data lists, but I said different ones. Um, but now this is, these numbers are much larger because we're talking England rather than Scotland. And again, brackets are the number of individuals observed by each um, source. And probably what is quite encouraging is the largest number is in drug treatment agencies. So we've got 65,000 individuals observed in total. This is across the whole of England. 10,000 are recorded on more than one list. So that's just about a sixth. So I think that's the biggest proportion we had observed um, of all the examples. So should we just do exactly what we've done before? We can. But the interesting thing with this case is that we also have other information. We don't just have these four sources. We have other information. And previously, what we may have done is go, well, this is our data. Let's ignore the other information. Just turn the handle, and out comes your answer again. But when you've got other information, it's really wasteful to just throw it away. You don't want to do that. You don't like throwing away information. It's not good. Data scientists don't, don't like doing that. We want to be able to incorporate all of the available information. So what other information do we have? Well, 
we can get another guess at what the total population is. Remember I said we'd come back to the idea of guessing? It's not a real guess in that it's just a blind guess. It's an educated estimate. So it's a guess, but in a slightly different way. So what we actually also have is the number of heroin-related deaths um, in England. And of course, this fluctuates every year. So we've taken an average over four years. This is why it's not a full number. So we've got 772.75 number of heroin-related deaths in a year. But we also know what the injecting death rate is. Or oh, I'll rephrase that. We have an estimate of what the injecting death rate is. Because of course, it will also fluctuate. So it's generally accepted that the death rate for injectors is about 0.6% a year. And again, we have some uncertainty interval between 0.3 and 1.2. So if we know the number of deaths and we know what the death rate is, we can combine those numbers. You divide the number of deaths by the rate to give an estimate of what the total population is. And we do this, we get an a point, what's called a point estimate, a single estimate. So we divide 772 by 0.6 and we get we think around about 129,000 drug users in England. But we can also use the uncertainty interval to come up with what our uncertainty interval is on the population size. And it's quite large. It's between 64 and 268,000. So on its own, this is a guess at what the total population size is. It's not a very precise guess. It's quite between 64 and 268. If you went to someone involved in doing policy, they would probably go, well, that's quite large. It could be, if it's the upper or lower end, then it's quite, it's quite a difference what we're going to be doing. And if you notice, actually, this is less than the number we observe, and we know we're likely to miss quite a number. So we've got this information, and we could throw it away, but that, I said, seems really wasteful. We want to be able to incorporate this within our, S, within our analysis, and we do that by something that may, some of you may have heard of. Uh, it's called Bayes' theorem. So this is the Reverend Thomas Bayes. He's attributed with the uh, birth of, of the idea. Um, Laplace was also involved in, he actually sort of formulated a bit more formally. Um, but it goes back to about 250 years. And the paper was actually only published uh, posthumously after his death. I'm not going to go through the maths of it, but the basic idea is as follows. You've got some prior beliefs. In our case, we've got this guess of what the total population is, 129,000 with this rather wide um, uncertainty interval. So this is before we've actually seen our four lists. This is what we would think. We then go out and collect our data from the four lists, and we get information from that. Then we have our, we have our initial beliefs. We see the data, and then we update what we initially thought what, now that we've seen the data, to give what's called our posterior beliefs. That's called a Bayesian analysis. So we have some initial prior guess, you observe data and you update your, your guess based on the actual data that you have. And that way you're not throwing away this information. So, in this case, what do we have? Hopefully you can see this a bit, a bit faint. This is what you thought before you collected any data. So this is your estimate based on the um, injecting death rate. As you can see, it's quite vague. As you'd expect, once you've collected your data, you're much more certain what you have. So then this is what we have. This is our sort of estimate after. And you can see there's quite a lot of overlap, but it is on the right, sort of the, in the right, on the right hand side of our, what we initially thought. So it looks like that we sort of, our death rate led us to believe the number was smaller, but when we actually collected the data, we shifted it and we get this estimate. And it's about 210,000. And again, now you can see the interval is much narrower than we, our initial guess, as you would hope when you've collected better data. But you can go and do more things. Often, the total population size is what you're estimated in. Sometimes you're inter interested in what dependencies exist. But off, more often than not, you actually, once you've got your estimate of the total population size, you're interested in certain functions of it. And in particular, in this case, we might be really interested in what the injecting death rate is. Because that's how we came up with our priors. 
what we initially thought about guess. So we can combine the estimates of the total population size with the observed deaths, injecting deaths, and come up with the death rates. And remember, we, our initial thought was there are, we think, based on uh, lots of other information, that it's roughly about 0.6% is our best guess, but it varies between 0.3 and 1.2%. Our overall death rate, injecting death rate, was 0.4. So it falls within this, what we started with our... So that's, that seems realistic. But so I've, I've hidden some of the analysis. But what we also had was information on age and gender. So actually, we, we, we do a slightly more complicated analysis. And then, as a result, we estimate not just the total population size, but given for the population of males, or we call them young males and, and older males, and similarly for fem young females and old females. And what's interesting is the young females. The inject drug -related, injecting drug-related death rate seems quite low. And this has also been observed in Scotland. It doesn't seem to exist uh, to um, continue into the older age group, but for the younger age group, it is smaller. And so this also appears uh, for Scotland, which is interesting in itself. So, in summary, have we, have we solved the problem? Can, if we're asked a question now, how many, can we go and collect data and answer it? Hopefully in a more sophisticated way, but possibly initially in a Lincoln-Peterson estimator, or being more sophisticated if we can collect more data. The answer, unfortunately, in some ways, is uh, not quite. We have more tools now at our disposal, but we wouldn't really be scientists if we didn't say, can we do better? We always want to know, can we do better? What happens if this assumption doesn't hold? How can we test whether this assumption holds? These are the interesting questions that continue. And as a result, this is why my job is really interesting. I'd be really bored if I go, right, we've solved the problem, put it in a drawer, go away. That, that, that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is, how can we improve? And that's always going to be the question in any data-driven science environment. We always want to ask, can we do better? So I'm still working on this, and I will probably continue to work on this for the rest of my academic career. It's not an easy problem, but it's a very simple question. Thank you. I think it was in question two. Uh, I think the answer was around about 13,000 yep. when we assumed no dependencies. Yeah, the modern day slavery one. And then I think it came down to 11,000 when we factored in the dependencies. It strikes me that those numbers are still quite similar. Is any comment on that? <laughs> It all depends on the strength of the dependence between them. The stronger the dependence, the more different the answers typically are. Um, in this case, there were six dependencies. I think four were negative and two were positive. So there were some arguably cancelling out as well. So in other examples, you will get very different estimates dependent on when you put in dependencies and so on. So it, it's not a very simple question. And it's very data dependent. I'm Yogesh Charlie. Um, I currently work in insurance. So one of the questions that I actually had was one problem that comes straight to mind is that a lot of the data sources that you provided came from uh, public sector like police records, hospital records, and these are quite easily found online. The question that I had is that when collecting data, there's obviously a large cost factor attributed to it and the data you had was on a national level. What is the benefit of using a smaller sample size and using the same matrix analysis extended? And is there any cost benefit on like doing the su sampling on a smaller level and then projecting it? Or is the story, the standard error, a lot larger when you project that analysis? 
there's, if you do a small... Could you repeat the question? Because I'm not sure. The, the question is, could you... Um, it's going to be a cost related to collecting these data sources, and in particular, for one of them, it's hugely expensive. Uh, so I'm going to answer your question in two parts. Um, I mean, I know you asked one. And the other one is, as a result of that, can you do it on a smaller, sam a smaller survey size and then multiply it up? Um, th there is a different cost between all of them. And if in this one... The social inquiry reports, getting this information is a hugely expensive action that they, it takes manpower to go out and go around all the different regions in Scotland to collect that information. The other ones are held electronically and are much easier. When there's a big disparity between cost of one source to the others, it is possible to remove it. Um, and there is some being discussion whether um, this is worth collecting. The more lists you have, the less danger there is in removing one in that you've still got a lot of other information. Um, and you can look at, that, uh, look at some sort of uh, formal decision analysis where you have a cost built into the collection of the data compared to your results based on how precise they are. So one way is to remove some of the sources if they're very expensive, and, but you would have to check that you're not actually significantly adversely affecting your results in terms of precision suddenly goes out of... Um, all proportions. The other way, which you suggest, is to do it on a smaller survey and expand up. Again, you can do that, but again, you will have, again, this extra cost um, of the, <coughs> well, not cost, you'll have the consequence of the precision um, decreasing, so a larger uncertainty. Again, you could do this into a formal cost analysis, sort of a decision analysis theory problem and to see whether it's worthwhile. I suspect in a lot of cases you probably can and it's worthwhile doing it on a smaller survey. But it would be dependent on what the exact question is and how precise you need your estimates to be. If you have a reason you need your estimates to be precise, then you should get as much data as you can. If you, it, it has less issue, then you, you, don't, you don't need a, such an es accurate estimate, then you can do it that way as well. So it depends on how much accuracy you need as well. But I think, yeah, that is one way to go. You, you mentioned how a lot of it came down to these dependencies, both positive and negative. And I, I see how you would sort of see if there was a dependency, but how would you actually calculate from the data you collected how, mu how big the dependency was, and then how would you apply that in your thing to change the numbers? I, I, I've hidden all those details very cunningly that you've managed to spot. Um, you, there's two questions. One is, is the dependency exist? And then how strong is it? And you actually, you estimate, well, if you, you would fit a model to the data, I deliberately haven't used the word model in the talk, um, and you actually estimate if the dependence is there or not. And then if you, want, if you have it, it's there, you also estimate it's how big it is. So it's all done within the statistical analysis. It falls out, essentially. Um, you don't specify what it is. You estimate it itself. And then, so you don't say it's positive or negative. You actually fit um, these statistical tools or models to the data. And the data then, when you turn a handle, um, do the statistical analysis, it will tell you that's a po that positive interaction. It's this big. Actually, I'd like to ask a question. Do you ever find that you are dealing with situations where people don't like the way you've analysed the data because they don't like the answers you're getting? I, I, I'll answer that in... in, in uh, oh my, so once I said that, to focus on the Bayesian analysis, one where I said, you, you, you say, well, what's your best guess? And I once asked someone and said, well... <laughs> You know, do you know anything about the data? What would you expect to have the answer as? And they went, I have no idea. It could be anything. So then I did the analysis, gave them the answer, and they went, that's wrong. That can't be that large. <laughs> so, yes, in that sense. But then the, uh, what we did then was actually go and do look at the death rates and so on and bring it informally into the analysis. So the way I would answer that is if someone came and said, I don't like that answer, you go, why? If they've got a reason that say, well, that number doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to um, match this other information, you would bring it that information informally within the analysis. 
the analysis that you've done is based on the number of, um, I'll say, positive incidences. So someone who is using, uh, who's an injector, does it work in reverse? Can you try and find the number of people that aren't injectors, then subtract it? For instance, um, people who donate blood declare that they're not an injecting drug user. So could you use that list to work backwards and eliminate the number of people who aren't injecting drug users? Of what population? Any population, I suppose. I, I don't know. I'm just asking if you could approach it from the other angle and eliminate. Um, oh, I see what you mean. I mean, the ultimate thing would be, well, whoever's left, you know what the total population is, whoever's left, take them away. Typically, yeah. that population is going to be larger to estimate than the injecting ones. Sure. So I, there might be something in that you could look at. But I suspect you can't use the two together. You couldn't have a list of people who definitely don't inject drugs combined in the same analysis with people who definitely do. It would help if we knew that for the HCV database. How do you ask a cod for its date of birth? <laughs> do you want me to answer that? No, you don't have to. <laughs> right. um, I think it just remains for me to uh, ask you to thank Ruth very much for a really interesting lecture. And uh, let's do that.